Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you're doing well today. And if you're new here, every Saturday, we break down the latest news and the hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency over a cup of delicious coffee, which again today is Onyx Coffee Roasters, Costa Rica, Las Lajas. That being said, in today's episode, I'm talking about Terra Luna and why it's poised for huge growth in 2022. Elrond, our usual 404 Logic Not Found segment and more. So make sure that you stick around for the whole show, no matter where you're watching or listening to it, for all these updates, okay? If you like crypto, please do subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification button, or you can follow the podcast on your platform of choice so you can get a heads up whenever I post new episodes of Crypto Over Coffee every single Saturday. And just a friendly reminder, please be aware of scammers that are in the comments of YouTube posing as me and other crypto YouTubers trying to scam you. This is happening across all sorts of social media platforms, people impersonating me and other people in the crypto space. Remember, I don't have a WhatsApp. I'm not going to ask you to contact me. I'm not going to ask you to pay me, okay? If the comment does not have the name highlighted like you see here on the screen, it is not me and you can report them. So please be safe. By the way, thanks to everyone who entered the giveaways for last week's episode 100 of Crypto Over Coffee Celebration. I have reached out to the winners via YouTube comments and Twitter DMs. And so for those who won the random draw, congratulations. Make sure you check your notifications to make sure you get a heads up to see if you won. All right, so the headline of this video tells you the main story, but I wanna tell you some of the reasons why I think that Terra Luna looks poised for huge growth in 2022 from my perspective, even after an already great 2021 with a lot of growth. At the beginning of 2021, Terra, the smart contract enabled network in the interoperable Cosmos ecosystem or in the Cosmos, was a little known name with a few powerful dApps built on it. And that were those were like Anchor Protocol, Mirror and Chai. It was far from a household name. That's the main point. And at the end of 2021, Terra had over 100 dApps, huge growth of its native token Luna, and adoption for the UST stablecoin, a larger total value locked in DeFi than Binance Smart Chain. Needless to say, it grew a ton. Now in 2022, I have no doubt in my mind that growth will continue for a number of reasons. First of all, the Cosmos ecosystem itself is growing and liquidity is flowing into Cosmos projects as they've sort of come to maturity along with the Interblockchain Communication or IBC protocol for multi-chain interoperability. The fact of the matter is that builders seem to want to build on interoperable blockchain networks, and it would make sense for them to do it, right? You're getting more potential users, more potential liquidity or value flowing into your dApp, etc. because you're not limited to the users of your origin chain. Users can come from at least the entire rest of the cosmos, but with things like the wormhole bridge, you have access to Solana, to Avalanche, to Ethereum, and more, in addition to what's already there natively. What that equates to is Terra starting to serve as sort of the fulcrum for DeFi and even metaverse type use cases through interchain applications that span many different blockchains. And that's a really good place to be. It puts you at the center of it all. Now, it's equally important for a smart contract enabled blockchain to be adequately full of users and liquidity but also to have developer friendliness because devs will not build if they're not equipped with the right tools. And Terra has a solid JavaScript library to help developers build dApps on the platform, along with a development environment called Terrain that makes building far easier on the Cosmwasm platform. Furthermore, Terra's $150 million tranche of funding in 2021 to catalyze development will likely pale in comparison to funding in 2022, with $139 million in funding proposed already in support of the uptake of interchain use cases for the UST, USD stablecoin ecosystem like Ethereum, Polygon, and Solana. Then there's also 50 million in ecosystem funding that's reportedly focused on supporting development on top of Terra. And that's only what we know about now in January of 2022, let alone what might come next throughout the year. That being said, the single biggest reason that Terra is seemingly unstoppable is its approach to stable coins and the dominance it could have in the years to come in that area. The Luna cryptocurrency itself is an input for the algorithmic balancing for UST, the US dollar stablecoin that has continued to garner more and more adoption and fanfare in the last several months. And by nature of this algorithmic method for stabilizing the price peg, Luna is burned as new UST is issued. So what does this mean? 
It means that as UST becomes more widely adopted, more Luna is burned. And in turn, you see positive price pressure that results from that mechanism. You've seen Luna do great over the last year. Because of Cosmos's underlying interoperable nature, UST is pretty uniquely positioned to be a de facto stablecoin standard across the crypto ecosystem, which would in turn mean that demand would or could skyrocket for UST in and outside of Cosmos. And this is undoubtedly why that aforementioned funding is going towards the adoption of UST in DeFi outside of the Cosmos. So Terra's early focus on native stablecoins and adoption of the interoperability technology in IBC is the key to this growth, and it will continue to be the key in 2022. Liquidity and stablecoins drive the entire ecosystem around crypto, and Terra is a huge player in this area. There are even rumors abound about a big set of updates coming under the name of Redacted, basically a redacted name we don't really know, and that's piqued my interest. But I won't speculate as to what that news is, we'll just have to wait and see. And you'll notice that I haven't made a bold price prediction here. And that's because it would be unfair of me to do so because I have no idea where the price is going from here. However, I have long-term conviction in Terra, whether we go up, down, or sideways in the months to come, this is a long play for me, but one that's squarely at the center of my multi-chain vision for the future of crypto. Interoperability is key. Despite the regulatory uncertainty and the nascency of Terra, it is one of my most prized areas of study for 2021 and it will continue in 2022. But what do you think about Terra? Let me know in the comments. And next up, folks, is our crypto market update, which thankfully today has a bit of green to report after weeks of negative price action on this show. Now, last week, we talked about the macroeconomic forces that push risk assets like crypto down really hard, along with equities and traditional markets, for example, and the unpredictable nature of the Federal Reserve's actions that drive a lot of these macroeconomic forces. Right now, at the time of recording, we're sitting at around $43,000 Bitcoin, $3,300 Ether, and many altcoins are up about a half a percent or so on the day, again, at the time of recording. This week marked a kind of a rebound from the bearish sentiment that we've been seeing for a while. But I remain unconvinced that we're done with the price volatility that we've been seeing. It's distinctly possible that $39,000 Bitcoin was the bottom, but we really don't know. And I look at some of the common metrics like hash rate on Bitcoin, which is at, at or near all time highs, uh, balance on exchanges continuing to drop overall, and more big name players buying Bitcoin, right? This 1% uh, allocation for the Rio de Janeiro reserve it's pretty significant and it paints a more positive long-term picture for me in terms of Bitcoin. And you know the drill, where Bitcoin goes, the market follows. So watching Bitcoin's performance is critical to understanding the market conditions. Now the wild card is the aforementioned Federal Reserve approach and the actions they take. Because if we see large scale assets sell off, rising interest rates, etc., things could get really ugly really fast, along with other risk assets. So it's somewhat unpredictable and you need to know that risk and that lack of predictability if you're getting into the markets right now. Please be very careful, okay? In other news, the time has finally come and one of my favorite metaverse projects, Network or NetVRK, is starting to roll out with NFT minting for those who purchase land, vehicles, avatars, etc. in the NFT sales last year. Full transparency, I did buy land in an early sale for Network why? Because I love the project and that's why I talk about it on the channel so much. But anyways, I've left a link to the guide for minting your NFT land, vehicles, and avatars in the description in case you are one of those who bought into these early sales of network assets. Once minted, you'll be able to see your NFT assets on OpenSea in your wallet. And in late January, these assets will become tradable on the open market after a sort of vestment period. This marks the very beginning of what I think will be a huge growth phase for a network because now that users have the assets in their wallets, the next pieces can fall into place around the utility for these assets like land and vehicles and avatars and making them playable and usable and tradable. Next, the network marketplace is going to launch, which will allow users to openly trade these assets. And then the path to exploring the digital world network as created will really kick into high gear. To my knowledge, there will also be a phase three NFT sale coming up for those who want to check that out. But nonetheless, keep your eye out for the Hashoshi headquarters in Network when the launch does come. I'll come up with some fun community engagement events to facilitate in the digital world. Now, I do also want to cover a really important topic that 
I actually don't think I've really talked about on this channel before. And that's the idea that blockchain protocols, a lot of these layer ones, for example, have to come up with a solution for the ever increasing resource demands for nodes or clients who keep a copy of the blockchain ledger. If you think about sort of the mechanics or the way that a blockchain works, it basically is a network that reaches consensus amongst a set of distributed nodes or clients who each keep a copy of this blockchain ledger. And at each round of consensus, a new block of transactions is appended to the last one in a verifiable and tamper evident chain. In other words, this blockchain is append only, where new data is appended to the existing history of the blockchain. And by that hand, each node client in general needs to store this history as it grows. To a point, this storage requirement among other compute resources means that the bar keeps getting higher for those who wish to run a node and independently validate or participate in the network. And this is a threat to decentralization because if that bar keeps rising, people that can't handle that, people can't afford that, can't participate. And one that every blockchain must solve. This is a problem that every blockchain must solve. So we need ways to securely store historical data in a verifiable and decentralized way and to serve that up in that same way without requiring it all to be stored on disk. So to give you a bit of context, Ethereum right now, about a block height of 14 million blocks, the historical data takes up around 410 gigabytes, at least on my node. And you need a nice one terabyte SSD to even consider running a full node. And that's going to continue to go up from here. So I read a really cool Ethereum improvement proposal, which is number 4444 or four fours, that would seek to prune historical data on the network on a rolling one year basis in epochs or consensus cycles. And this would reduce the compute resource demands for validating new blocks and running a node therein whilst also balancing the security requirements and the requirements for verification. The trick is then finding a way to adequately store and decentralize the full historical data that's still important to have and to serve that up in an effective way. So there are many ideas here, like using IPFS, for example, but this proposal is likely going to evolve over time. And I know it's not all done and dusted, but it's a great thought experiment that I'll be following uh, as this wears on. In other news, this past week, news broke that the Elrond Foundation had acquired the established crypto payments platform Utrust, which I've actually covered on the channel many times in the past. And this was in order to push forward on plans to integrate merchant payment mechanisms into the Elrond ecosystem. Surely more details will come out about this ongoing acquisition and post-acquisition plan, but the concept that was introduced in the early press and media around this was the idea of merchant yield, quote unquote. This merchant yield idea is basically that rather than paying a percentage of total transaction volume to the payment processor on a cadence as a merchant, crypto payments denominated in various cryptocurrencies can be used to generate yield in DeFi, for example, to offset the cost of those transaction fees for merchants to help them basically earned for using the platform. Of course, regulatory implications and stability of yields will be really important for any business looking to adopt this. But the idea is one that I think could make crypto payments for merchants a little bit more appealing and a little bit more sustainable down the line. So we'll have to see how this whole thing unfolds. Now it is time for Rational Reactions, a somewhat new segment on the show where I read headlines from tech and crypto related publications and give you my instant unfiltered rational reaction at least hopefully it's rational so let's switch over to the computer and we can get started let me uh, get a pretty important sip of coffee here now the first story is from coin telegraph and this story is Solana could become the visa of crypto, says Bank of America. The Bank of America strategist stated that Solana is set to take a slice of Ethereum's market share thanks to its low transaction fees, scalability, and ease of use. Now, I actually don't think Bank of America meant this that way. But in fact, to be honest with you, I do think that Bank of America is saying something that is somewhat true. What they're saying, in effect, is that they're saying... Solana is going to become Visa based on transaction volume. But in reality, I think they're also correct in that Solana is sort of this half true decentralized Web3 vibe and then also half uh, traditional finance. And it appeals to that sort of venture capitalist culture. It appeals to the, uh, the centralized finance world. And you see a lot of people supporting it. And I'm not saying it's because it's bad, 
But the only thing that I want to say here is that Solana has a lot of good things about it. It has a lot of things that need work. I feel like the things that need work are only talked about by people who criticize Solana, and I wish it were talked about by people who support it. And that's the big thing that I want to say, is that in order to become the visa of crypto, something that's relied upon for payments, Solana needs to fix the issues that it has. They need to fix the availability and the reliability issues that we've started to see. And just acknowledge those, acknowledge them publicly, please. That's all I, that's all I have to say. But it very well could become the visa of crypto, both in its appeal to centralized entities and as a payment processor, but also sort of halfway in that world of Web3. So I don't know what you think about that. Next in the list is also another Cointelegraph story. Coinbase announces nearly the entire company will shut down for four week-long breaks in 2022 to allow workers to recharge. Given the intensity of our work throughout the year, we think this is the best way to ensure our pace is sustainable for the long term, said Chief People Officer LJ Brock. That's from Coinbase. Um, this is maybe you're going to think this is irrational, but if any time the markets are way up or way down, Coinbase already shuts down, so they already are getting some breaks. Uh, okay, now we can laugh about that, but it's actually not really that much of a joke. It's kind of true. But I actually think this is realistically, jokes aside, a probably good thing to see is that we don't need to recreate the culture of traditional finance, which is like insane hours, you know, working around the clock and all that sort of thing. The markets in crypto never sleep, and it's very difficult to disconnect, even as an individual not working at Coinbase. So I actually applaud them for doing this, even though I just made a joke at their expense. Next question is from Cointelegraph. Vitalik deluged after asking for the most unhinged criticisms about him. Buterin has been the golden child of crypto and the recipient of some of the most trenchant criticism or trenchant. I've actually never heard that word. For a bit of fun, he decided Friday was the day he wanted to dig some notable digs up and share them with his Twitter followers. I want to just say that I actually did read some of these tweets and some of the things that people say about Vitalik. I, I don't understand because quite frankly, even if you hate Ethereum, even if you lost a ton of money to gas fees, the stuff personal, the, the kind of personal stuff that was said about him is really kind of crazy and it's a proof that the sort of a non culture has its benefits but also some really bad things about it too because people are comfortable saying terrible stuff vitalik actually deserves a lot of credit because he is intellectually honest he acknowledges the issues with ethereum he acknowledges the failures he has made in the past and he's always looking to improve in the future and to fix those problems he doesn't deserve this type of abuse so i just want to put that out there and let that be known this one is from Coindesk. Nayeb Bukele is not the Bitcoin hero we need. Evidence that El Salvador's president has targeted journalists and suppressed free speech contradicts Bitcoin's core values. Listen, I think it's cool that El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. It's really cool. We get that. Here's my issue. I don't think this is the way to do it. Bitcoin is only freedom if it's a choice. If I can, as a citizen, make a choice to use Bitcoin... In, as an alternative to something else, that's when Bitcoin's at its finest. It's not when it's forced, when everyone has to do it, even though they don't want to. That's that's not freedom. And for someone to, and I and I don't know as much about this. I'm I'm reading this headline, so I haven't gotten to see all the things. But I've seen some concerning stuff from this this leader, if you can say that, in El Salvador. Stuff that is not in line with the ethos of Bitcoin. And that scares me. I don't want this to be the example of what other countries should do with Bitcoin as legal tender and Bitcoin at the center. I don't think that's healthy and I don't think that's good. I don't know what you think. Let me know in the comments if I'm way off. And the last one for the day is also on Coindesk. Web3 is a long fight worth fighting. Decentralization has been on the minds of internet futurists for more than 20 years. That doesn't make the need to break with Web2 any less urgent, says Coindesk's chief content officer. I agree with this statement. Web3 is a long fight. There are issues here. Jack Dorsey, we talked about his talk about Web3 being just another sort of iteration of the old version of things with VCs dominating everything where you don't actually own anything. I don't really agree with that, but I do agree that there's a lot of growing pains that are going to be associated with this. It's going to take time to get to the end state that we're looking for. And a lot of the Web3 of the future hasn't been invented yet. 
it's 2022. Like this has not even been around for that long and it's gonna take time for that, this stuff to mature. It's a big change. And so I don't think that we need to be in such a huge rush to say, oh, it's over, it can't work, or it's not going to work. A lot of this stuff hasn't been invented yet. Maturity is coming. So completely agree with this statement. That being said, let's talk about something I don't agree with on 404 Logic Not Found, which is next up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for 404 Logic Not Found. And for those of you who are as of yet uninitiated in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves in the world that need to get some attention. And speaking of attention, if you want to help this episode of Crypto Over Coffee, get some attention from the algorithm robots that control this whole thing, please hit the like button. Get subscribed if you're on YouTube, or you can follow the podcast if you're on a podcast platform, because it tells the robots that you're enjoying the content, you're interacting with it, and other people might also enjoy it. So thank you very much for doing that in advance. And this is a somewhat familiar 404, but some that's still relevant, right? It's still very relevant, and it is the continued media and crypto critic assertion that crypto is primarily used by criminals or for nefarious activity. This is the most common diatribe that you hear from those who either A, do not fully understand crypto or the underlying technology that underpins it, or B, those who are motivated for another reason to denigrate cryptocurrency and all of those who use it. Unfortunately for these critics, the data, the hard data, tells a much different story than the headlines. The blockchain analytics company Chainalysis, who provide on-chain tracking and data for law enforcement, government agencies, and for other purposes like anti-money laundering for exchanges, for example, reported that cryptocurrency use for criminal activity is at an all-time low proportional to legitimate use in the last year. To be specific, Chainalysis report found a mere 0.15% of crypto transactions to be tied to nefarious activities. Great, now do cash. And I say this in jest, but it begs a really good question. Why do the critics of cryptocurrency ignore the clear fact that great British pounds, euros, US dollars, and other fiat currency notes are used in a far greater proportion for criminal activity than cryptocurrency is? Of course, because of the massive growth of the crypto markets, the total value of cryptocurrency for illicit use is also at an all-time high. So guess what gets reported in the headlines? And that much is obvious because you've probably seen the headlines. And by no means do I intend to minimize the fact that any amount of crime is unacceptable, but the fact remains, the data tells a much different story than the headlines. And it's that incongruency that I take issue with. I mean, Chainalysis's business model is predicated on helping catch bad people and finding these patterns on blockchains. So what incentive do they have to underreport crime? None. And secondly, if you think for five seconds, any logical person would realize that by facilitating criminal activity on a public tamper evident ledger that literally stores your every move for the world to see forever is a boon for law enforcement, not a blocker. And you've seen it all year in 2021 with law enforcement catching criminals using the traceable data on these public blockchain networks. And I'm all for constructive criticism and the crypto markets are deserving of criticism. They need to mature so that scams and crime can be stamped out. But it's an undeniable 404 logic not found to attack an entire industry on false pretense like it has been for so long. Anyways, it is time for sponsor time, which keeps my coffee cup full of delicious coffee and helps me make these videos week in and week out would not be possible without folks like you and the kind folks who sponsor the show. So first, I want to thank the long-term sponsor of the show, Ledin, who offers stellar yield on deposits of Bitcoin and USDC in their savings account product. Ledin is a sort of one-stop shop for many people around the world to earn compounding interest on their cryptocurrency, but also to get access to other products like low interest collateralized loans against their Bitcoin, for example, which is very useful in instances where someone doesn't want to divest from Bitcoin, still believes in it long-term, but might need to get some access to li liquid capital for real world purchases. If you want to give Ledin a try, I've left a link in the description below and in the pinned comment, and users can earn $10 in USDC for a qualifying deposit when they sign up. I would also like to thank Spirit Swap, who were kind enough to sponsor this episode of Crypto Over Coffee. And as you may know, if you follow me on Twitter, which you should, I've been delving deeper and deeper into DeFi on the Phantom Opera network, mostly known as Phantom. And one of my go-to decentralized exchanges on Phantom has been for a long period of time, Spirit Swap. And there are quite a few ways to utilize Spirit Swap from the traditional swap and exchange of fungible tokens to 
earning yield for providing liquidity to yield farming that's become incredibly prevalent in DeFi around the ecosystem. However, Spirit Swap has a few interesting extras that I think are pretty notable. First of all, you have boosted farms, which basically allows owners of the in-spirit governance token to vote as to how emissions or protocol rewards are allocated into certain farm asset pools to boost the overall yield from said farms. Boosted farms have been around for a while in Spirit Swap for a subset of the total asset farms in the protocol. But this month, around January 19th, 2022, all farms on the protocol will be available for in spirit voting to boost the farm yields. And this full migration to community governed boosted farms has been a source of excitement for Spirit Swap users, in particular liquidity providers, for a while now. So it is nice to see this landing on schedule. Now, I also want to highlight the ongoing collaboration between Spirit Swap and Liquid Driver, another Phantom DeFi project focused on bootstrapping liquidity into the Phantom ecosystem. And this partnership basically is there to give users access to another permutation of the Spirit token called Liquid Spirit or Lin Spirit. On Liquid Driver, Spirit holders can swap one to one for Lin Spirit, this liquid form of In Spirit, which not only takes Spirit out of circulation, but also gives users a liquid token to use in the markets while not giving up the benefits of the governance token In Spirit that can be used for voting on boosted farms and the like. I know there's lots of spirits going on here. Whenever I talk about this, I always feel crazy. But this is a great example of the composability of DeFi in action, building collaborative and mutually beneficial products at the intersection of two or more DeFi protocols. Remember though, you should know the risks of DeFi before putting one cent on the line. Things like impermanent loss and even regulatory posture in your geography are important things to note before you do anything. I also want to reiterate that this nor any episode of my show is a call to action to buy tokens or make an investment of any kind. Just so we're clear. All right, folks, let's do some community Q&A. I always love answering questions from folks who watch the show, and I've got some questions from last week's episode that I'm going to answer. And I want to remind you that if you have a question that you want answered, there are no such things as noob questions. I'll answer as many as I can. Leave them in the comments below on YouTube, or you can tweet me at Hishoshi4 as well. Just make sure you tag me, and let's dive into these questions. Let's go over to the computer and check these out. So we've got a handful of questions. I think we have maybe three today. First question is from Simone Le Sorcier, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I try my best. Could you comment on your go-to indicator for TA and the time frame you prefer using it? So I'm going to kind of uh, buck the trend a little bit. I'm not a huge TA guy. And it's not only because that's not my background. I'm not a big TA trader type. I'm a very fundamentals and technology focused person. The other thing is I'm a much more longer term focused investor. I'm not very focused on short term trades that can you know, render me gains, not very often at least. I'll, I'll maybe do so in my iTrust Capital IRA, for example. And I've talked about that before. That's just about the only place where I do really aggressive trading. It's just not my thing. I do follow TA occasionally from some of my friends on Twitter who do that. I subscribe to a few areas where I can look at charts and kind of see overall patterns and trends, but overall I'm very much a macro focus guy. So I don't use TA a lot. And I'm saying that because it is proof that you can actually do okay without knowing TA. The other thing I want to say is that technical analysis is an art and in some ways a science, but by no means is it a guaranteed win. You can be a really good technical analyst and get totally foiled by macroeconomic conditions and unpredictable events, especially in small markets like crypto. I mean, you have to think about it. We're like, you know, we're, we've gone from like one, two, max three trillion dollars in total market cap across the board. If you're trading a small altcoin, you're one unpredictable whale sale away or one rug pull away from your TA being completely meaningless. Things change so fast. So I would say don't put as much stock in TA as you do in understanding fundamentally what you believe has value long term and building a plan that insulates you from the unpredictable. That includes taking profits off the board. That includes not over-risking in a very small market cap asset. And I know everyone's approach is different. Some people may totally vehemently disagree with my approach to things. Just giving you my opinions. This is how I sort of play in the markets. But again, I don't think that TA 
is a an extremely prescriptive way to predict what's going on in the markets and that's why you see ta often on twitter is you know forgotten about right people see it they might react to it and then you go back and you're like oh yeah that wasn't correct so just take it with a grain of salt use it as only a part of your decision making process i think is the best way to compromise thank you simone or simon i said simone i meant simon whatever uh, second question is from Jason R. Rokich. What do you think of smart contract wallets like Argent and Loopring, especially regarding frequent transaction operations like gaming? Can these help bridge the security gap for folks who haven't invested in hardware wallets? Are there compatibility issues? Are there well, well reputed ones that work on chains other than Ethereum? Yes. So there are like there are good mobile smart contract wallets and non-smart contract wallets where you have like sort of multi-sig or you have a combination of, um, you know, a combination of off-chain and on-chain security mechanisms, lots of different options out there. Argent and Loopring are really good examples of this. And I do really like them. These are viable for these day-to-day transactions. Yes. Um, but I wouldn't store my whole portfolio on these only because there's always risk in something that is hot, no matter what. If nothing else, if someone gets a hold of your phone, they could do a lot of damage. At least in this case, if you have your hardware wallet, they still need your pin, they still need uh, another device. It's not as easy to, to do that. You're not carrying your hardware wallet around with you every day, at least for the most part. Most people don't. So I would say, yes, you can use these as a mechanism for gaming. I just think one thing people don't love is that you have to use Wallet Connect and that Wallet Connect can be a little clunky at times. And even when you're playing a game, you still gotta go and, and you know click sign and approve on transactions. It's really gonna depend on personal opinion. One wallet that I really like uh, that, that does a great job of this and other ecosystem, uh, Myar is great in the Elrond ecosystem. Kepler is fantastic in the Cosmos world. There's so many examples of these types of wallets, both smart contract wallets and non-smart contract wallets. It's just finding the one that makes sense for you. Long story short, don't put your whole portfolio on there, but you can use these as a stopgap for your day-to-day transactions and your gaming and things like that. Just make sure that if you're trying to use NFTs that the wallet you're using is compatible with NFTs. Just make sure that of that. Thank you for your question. Uh, last question of the day is from Robert Rudy. Congrats on 100 episodes. Thank you. Today's 101. On to the next one. Uh, just started watching your channel a few weeks ago, really enjoying it. You've mentioned interoperability a few times, and I tend to agree. What are your thoughts on the best projects for this? And I always take opportunities to share my thoughts on interoperability because it is the future of crypto. I have the utmost conviction in that. That's why I talk about this so much. That's what I believe is the future of crypto. Cosmos, obviously, I've talked about that today. I've talked about it recently. Fantastic ecosystem for people to build in the interoperability space. Polkadot, another one starting to come to fruition now. What we saw with Cosmos in 2021 is likely going to be for Polkadot in 2022. The delivery of parachains, the ability for people to use it for real and actually build things on Polkadot. We saw it with Kusama, I think almost two years ago now or a year and a half ago. A lot of opportunity in Polkadot. The other thing is other projects don't get a lot of attention. You're looking at projects like Icon, for example, one that's sort of a, a forgotten project from the 2017 era has built a really interesting uh, platform in BTP, the blockchain transmission protocol. This could be a huge thing that, that people can use across different ecosystems. They just announced a huge incentive fund for BTP. I think it's like $200 million worth to incentivize people to use this general comms protocol could be huge, right? That's a huge one. I mean, you look at other projects. Uh, OneChain was another one that's been working on interoperability for a long time. You have, of course, a ton of uh, non-generalized. You have like bridges like Wormhole, for example. And those are fine, but bridges require a lot of trust dynamics that are complicated. Uh, what's another one? Uh, Near Protocol is another one that's got some interoperability components in it. I mean, there are so many, and I can't even think of them all off the top of my head because there's so many working on this. But I would say the top three that I'm looking at right now in terms of doing deep technical research, Cosmos, Polkadot, Icon. Those are my my top three. Not necessarily like, oh, they're going to pump. That's not what my channel's about. But it's really just interesting technology. And there are many more. Leave them in the comments below. But that's my opinion. All right.
Thank you so much for your question. I think that is it. That is it. So thank you for watching this episode and every other episode of Crypto Over Coffee. If you have some time to stick around, I'll leave another really important video actually about some interesting stuff going on in the space here on the video. Uh, link screen, whatever the, the button is that they let me set up on the end screen. And if you're on the podcast platform, feel free to listen to another episode from maybe last week, some pretty good macroeconomic analysis going on there. Most of all, I want to say I appreciate you so much for watching and supporting the show. Thanks for, for everything, for supporting me for 100 episodes on to the next 100. Uh, until next time, hope you and your family have a wonderful week ahead. Cheers.